Good morning, everybody. Good morning. good morning. It is a good morning. I looked out the front window there, the front door window of our church, and the sun was out, and some wind was blowing some dust off of the roof, and it just came down in sparkles. And I looked at the trees, and they were all glass coated with, with ice, and it was just so pretty. Beautiful day. It's good that we could be here together, worship the Lord in a warm room. We're giving away, uh, by the way, warm hugs and, and uh, warm smiles and hot coffee, so this is the place to be on a cold winter morning. Welcome, everybody. If you're joining us in, from, uh, in YouTube or, or later on, you come across this video and, and uh, you listen to the sermon, uh, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. We like to uh, advance our, our footprint in YouTube land so more people will visit our site and come to our church where they'll be loved. It's a great church. We're not a big church, but we're a church that loves one another and loves our neighbors and even loves our enemies. So we're glad that we can be here together today. We're going to look at Galatians 4, 1 through 7. This is a continuation of our study in Galatians, but it's been over a month since we've been in Galatians because of the holiday preaching and my being away and so forth. So uh, we're going to have to uh, do a little bit of backtracking and catching up to speed on the book of Galatians. Here's the text. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So this is a reference to what happens in the world when a parent dies and the child is an heir, he's not old enough to be responsible to take in the inheritance. There's, there's managers and things set up in the legal system to protect that child until the date when he's mature and can then receive his inheritance. So that's what this is talking about. From the date until the father, or the date set by the father. So also we... While we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. That's something we're going to have to go into and look at more carefully. The rest of the passage goes, But when the fullness of the times came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you that we have this passage to encourage us that we are children of God set free from our slavery to sin. And we're just so amazed at what you have done to conquer sin for us, to defeat it, and to lead us in eternal life so that we will one day have glorified bodies serving you in a kingdom of perfect love and peace and joy. Uh, Lord, for right now, we've we got to get the word out. I pray you'll help us to do that. Help us through our, our online ministry as well as our neighborhoods where we interact with people. Lord, we just care that people are, are ignorant of the truth that would save their souls. And they're so wrapped up into the things of this world, finding their, their uh, meaning and purpose in something that's so temporary and shabby. Help us, Lord, to, to give them the, the, the truth that is for the ages eternal life through Jesus, who loves us, who became a man, who walked among us, who was nailed to a cross so he could pay for our sins. Also, Lord, our Savior, Jesus, who rose from the dead, showing that he is the one true Messiah, the, the Christ, the, the God-man, the one to follow. And Lord, we want to follow you, and we thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. All right, so Galatians 4, 1 through 7 breaks down like this. First of all, verses 1 through 3, it talks about the bondage of sin. That's what we're going to cover today. 
But we also need to realize that it talks about, it brings us the key to, for, to freedom. We're enslaved to sin from the day we're born, but then, of course, Jesus sets us free when we come and trust him as our Savior. That's true on an individual level, but this passage is talking about a whole community of people who were bound in sin to the elemental things of the world, and then God at the right time sent to the world the Savior who brought the key to freedom, which is faith in him as our Savior. And then we see that we have the joy of new life, and we'll look at that the following week, where we can actually have a loving, intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father because of his spirit, he allows us to joyfully serve him and call him Abba, Father. So that's where we're going over the next three weeks. Let's first look at the bondage of sin. Galatians 4, 1 through 3. So the bondage of sin. We're bound in sin from the day we're born. And being enchained, enslaved, bound to sin means we are completely helpless and hopeless to get ourselves out of the sin nature in which we were born. We're bound in sin. Now, the sin can oppresses us in three ways. It oppresses us in that there is an enemy of God, a spirit who is working in the world even from the beginning, early human history, we see he appeared to Adam and Eve as a serpent. And he deceived them and he led them down a path of rebellion against God. And that corrupted all of us ever since. That's what the devil does to try and lock us in sin. And keep us away from a relationship with God. But then we also have our own flesh. Our flesh has been corrupted by that event. And, and we are bound in, in sin in such a way we can't get ourselves out of it no matter how hard we try. And it's a sad thing to see, but it's almost everywhere in the world, in almost every heart of mankind. It's a sad thing to see that, that people have a, a very subtle trust in their own goodness and their own ability to climb out of their sinful condition and what we do when we think we are able to establish some kind of righteousness that God will accept us as a good person we tend to justify ourselves by using the law well I don't have any other gods uh, I haven't murdered anyone I don't bear false witness therefore I'm good and God must want me and accept me but that is just sinful thought adding more sin onto our problem. Because sin is not so much the, 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 uh, the, the bad things that we do. It's bound deep into who we are. Trusting in our own heart is sinful. Trusting in man's ability to climb out of these sinful problems by politics is also sinful. There's no solutions for our problems coming from the world, the flesh, or the devil. We're stuck in an awful situation. And yet, we're decent people. There are a lot of non-Christians who are trustworthy enough to babysit your kids. They're decent people. There's a lot of people that, that live in this world and they think differently about issues than you do or I do or each other. There's so many opinions. And it's wrong to think that if we persuade people to our side, we're helping them out of their sinful condition. It's really unwise of us to Assume that we can judge others because we're all tainted with sin. We look at each other and we look at life through lenses that are fogged by sin. It's hopeless for any of us to ever think we've got an answer to any of these problems. We're bound 
The word bondage is, is really the issue. We're, we're enslaved to sin. We're born in sin. We, the harder we try to get out of sin, all we do is build up more sin. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, okay, so this is going back to the first three verses of that paragraph, as long as the heir is a child, an heir, of course, is somebody who is going to inherit an estate. A parent dies and wills the, the estate to their child or to their offspring. Now, you can't give over all that money to a small child. You have to put it in a trust. You put it in a trust, and then the child comes of age, and then he receives his inheritance. Now, what are we really talking about here? In order to figure this out, we're going to need to do a little bit of review in the book of Galatians, because it's all the context of the first three, three chapters uh, this, that may comprise the context for chapter 4. So if you remember, Paul said, I am appalled that you are so quickly abandoning him who called you by his grace for a different gospel. He later on went and said, if anyone comes to you and preaches a different gospel than the one you've heard, let him be accursed. What's he talking about? Well, the Galatians fell into a trap of thinking that their own righteousness, their own ability to do good is going to make them right with God. There were some people that came along and said, well, God has go told us how to live. And it starts with you as a believer. Now you need to be circumcised and part of the Abraham's community. And so some of the Jews that were living at that time started to look down the nose at some of the Gentiles because of the issue of circumcision. And Paul said, I'm appalled. You would quickly abandon him. It's the gospel of salvation. By grace, God's loving gift of salvation, when you, when you accept him by faith, that's the gospel. Jesus is the Savior. Trust him with your soul. If so, you are put into God's family, and you don't need to put yourself under a law, especially something like circumcision. And that's another gospel. It's not even a gospel. Your, gospel, your trust in God's message to you of Jesus is the basis of your relationship with him. If you reject that, you reject him. And Paul was really upset, and so he wrote this letter rebuking the Galatians that they thought in their own heart, in their own goodness, they would be able to please God. In chapter 2, it says that knowing that man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus... Even we have believed, even we the Jews have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. We shouldn't be trusting the fact that we're Jews or that we're males or that we're rich or that we grew up in a Christian home. These things that, that may have happened to us in the past or we've been born into a situation, it's not what saves us. We're born in sin. We're bound to sin. We're enslaved to sin. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Now in verse chapter 3, we learn that the argument Paul's making is, is in contradiction to the argument of the false teachers who came in and said, well, the law came before Jesus, therefore the gospel has to take a back seat to circumcision. And Paul said, the law, which came 430 years after God promised salvation to, through Abraham, it does not invalidate the covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. Salvation has always been based on God's promise. If you lived before Jesus, there was a promised Messiah going to come and, and fix our entire world, including our own hearts. 
if you were born after Jesus, the promise was fulfilled when Jesus came and the Spirit now comes and links you in with the community of Abraham. You're born again. You're a part of God's family. And if you're a child or a son or a daughter of God, that's a special relationship. You can never lose that. God won't disown you. You are his child. And the promise of Abraham's community, the seed that came from Abraham would be a blessing to the whole world, came 430 years before Moses brought the law and the Ten Commandments and all of the stipulations that are in the Old Covenant law that were meant for Israel. And they were all uh, made obsolete by Jesus. That's what it says in the rest of chapter 3. It says, before faith came, in other words, before Jesus showed up, Adam was the first leader of the human race and he failed and all of us fell into sin. Jesus came and he lived up to the standard of faith. He went way above and beyond And he's the only one who never sinned. He was God in human flesh. He was our sacrifice on the cross. And he was worthy because he was perfect, because he was God, and because he was man. Man got us into this trouble. Man's got to get us out of this trouble. Man, trying to do that himself, turns to politics Oh, we got to get the right people in office and we got to get the right laws through Congress and that will fix everything. It will not. There's just no solution in man's efforts to try and solve his problems. Jesus, who came, he passed God's test. He became the sacrifice. God said, in you, my son, I am well pleased And we're now all saved on Jesus' coattails. When we have a relationship with him, we're a member of his community, we're saved because of his faith. He went to the cross, and we then join with him, and it's as though I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, and gave himself up for me. That also is chapter 2. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law. What does that mean? Being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Why would there need to be a law if the promise overrides the law? Why the law then? Well, he goes on to explain that the law was given. Therefore, the law has become our tutor, to lead us to Christ. The word tutor was a word that, that uh, for a servant within the home of a rich man whose kids were to go to school and learn and do their chores and, and live their life. But like all of us, kids oftentimes forget to do what they're supposed to do and they, their room doesn't get clean and they don't put their dishes away or whatever it is. They need someone to watch over them and keep them in line Because if a kid didn't have an adult watching over them, the kid honestly couldn't survive. And so Israel was God's nation that was given to this world to produce a Savior, Jesus. And to to write the Word of God, the Bible. And that process took about 1,500 years from the time that they became a nation until Jesus came was about 1,500 years. Israel had to survive that whole time. So the law was the tutor or the monitor, the servant that's in charge of making sure the kids don't do things that are going to get them killed. And so the law was given to Israel to keep them a nation for 1,500 years so the world could be blessed with a Savior. But once the Savior came and he paid the price for our sins and he rose again and ascended to his throne in heaven, now we have no need for a law. The law was never given as a ladder to climb up to God. We're not good enough to climb that high. 
We ought to just not trust that. I have a friend who I met in college, and he was a strong Christian, a brilliant guy. The one problem in his life that other people looked at and judged him for, I didn't, I didn't see a problem with this, was he had a ponytail about down to here. <laughs> so a guy with a ponytail about down to there, a lot of people think, eh, that's, that's, you know. So one day he's at home, and a church comes knocking on his door, and a, a, a deacon and a volunteer to their calling pro- program saw him with that ponytail, and they thought, oh, I got somebody that I can witness to. And so they asked him the question, do you know if you're saved and how you're saved? And he gave a brilliant answer. He said, well, I do know that I can't trust in my own righteousness. I'm not good enough. I would never make it no matter how hard I try. But I know Jesus came and he lived the perfect life for me and he died on a cross for my sins and I trust him as my savior. And then they said, well, but let me tell you how to get saved. You first of all need to stop trusting in your own righteousness and you need to accept Jesus as your savior. Isn't that what I just said? Well, if you did, you wouldn't have a ponytail down to here. What's that got to do with anything? We're not saved by complying with some set of rules that a church has devised. We're saved because Jesus is perfect. And when you attach yourself to him, you're adopted into his family and you're saved on his coattails. It's on Jesus to save us when we trust him as our savior. And we can't trust him as our savior and trust ourselves as our own savior at the same time. Self-righteousness is trusting ourselves to be good enough for God. And you can tell when someone's being self-righteous because they judge other people. You can tell when someone's being self-righteous because they tout their own religious credentials. People are saved out of their sin. They're bondage to sin. They're helpless and hopeless, no matter how good of a person they are. They could be worthy to babysit your children because they're honest and trustworthy. It doesn't mean they're good. It doesn't mean that they're saved. It doesn't mean that they're righteous before God. The only one ever who is, is Jesus. And our salvation is based on him. So when the faith came, there was no longer a need for the law. Therefore, the law uh, was our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under this tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. This is really cool. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Jew, Gentile, black, white, Rich, poor, educated, not educated, male, female, all of you who joined into Abraham's community, which today is the New Covenant Church, you've clothed yourselves with Christ. You can stand dressed for God's judgment in his courtroom above wearing perfect righteousness so that he judges you based on Jesus' credentials. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, I've come away in my journey of faith to take this verse seriously. There should be no difference. There's no accepted person and unaccepted person. There's no special class and lower class. There's no difference in responsibilities or giftedness based on any of these things that you're born with. Jew, Greek, slave, free, male, female. Those are not reasons to reject someone from serving. Because it says so right there. There is neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants Right? God came to Abraham. If you think about the world before Abraham, it was just a bunch of failure. Right? Adam sinned. Cain killed Abel. 
Uh, the world became so horrible that God wiped it out with a flood. They still didn't obey. God made the nations by confusing their language at Babel. And then God said, okay, the world now has been through enough failure. They've learned they can't trust themselves. I'm going to do something new, and I'm going to reach out to this man Abraham and be friends. And by faith, Abraham was able to, to trust God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham was the father of a new community, which in the Old Testament time was Israel, and the Gentiles who believed in God proselytized into Israel. But when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was ripped top to bottom. The, the Holy of Holies was exposed to everyone. The old covenant laws and stipulations became obsolete. Jesus says, love God, love neighbor, love enemies. The rule of the kingdom is love. And your, your ethical monitor is no longer a law, but the Holy Spirit. You live according to the Spirit in the new covenant age. So, if you belong to Christ, you are a member of Abraham's family, whether you're circumcised or not. Whether you're born Jewish or you're born Gentile, you're born male, female, rich, poor, black, white, it doesn't matter. We are all one in Christ. I'm really disappointed when, when uh, people that are well-intended and they care about people that are in oppressive circumstances uh, turn to politics to try and fix that. Those riots that happened a couple summers ago were, were supposedly to elevate a, a, a culture within America that had been underserved. But they turned to rioting and politics to try and get attention and get, get things changed. That was wicked. That's not powerful. What is powerful is the gospel. Telling the truth, speaking truth to power, is the way to do it. Not being a terrorist to try and tear down a system. And that's kind of a good segue into what we need to talk about here. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. So who's the heir in this question? The heir is Abraham's community, which existed before Jesus and continues today. And when they were a child, they were under the law to keep them a nation so that they could produce the Messiah for the world. And then after the Messiah came, now it's a church which exists in every nation. And, and now we have supposedly grown up. Given the analogy of when a child has a parent die, the parent puts his estate in a trust for the child. When he grows, he gets the inheritance. That's the same thing that happened with the law. The law was the guardian keeping the inheritance for the time when Abraham's community matured. And now we are Abraham's community and we're no longer under a guardian. We're no longer under the law. Now, as I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So we also. Now let's think about this. As it is in the law that a father can put his estate in a trust for the child to grow up and receive the inheritance, so also it is with Abraham's community. Israel was not capable of enlightening the world at the beginning, right? They hadn't written all the Bible, all the Old Testament yet, hadn't been written. Jesus hadn't come. No one was able to live under the law perfectly because we're all sinners. And the law was never given as a pathway to God. The law was given to keep Israel safe from nation-destroying sins like murder and adultery and and lying in 
court to get someone else in trouble or stealing. If, if those things are the norm in society, and by the way, they are becoming some normalized in America, that nation is destroyed. And if Israel is destroyed before the 1,500 years are done, we don't have a Savior. That's why God gave a law. And so we also, Abraham's community, while we were children before Jesus came, were held in bondage under a law. Salvation was always by grace through faith. But the community needed to survive. That's one of the reasons why it says, tell your children, generation after generation, hand down the truth, because it needs to last 1,500 years. They were, we were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. That's the key. What are the elemental things of the world? And how is it that we were in bondage to that? Bondage means we can't get out. We depend on it. But yet, we need out. We can't be in bondage. We have to be set free. What are the elemental things of the world? Well, there's a great example in Acts 17. Okay? Try and follow this. It's a bit of a long passage, and I got it all written out for you so you can, help, you can, you can read through it too. Now, while Paul was waiting for his partners in Athens, okay, Athens was a city in Greece. It was known for its philosophers, right? You can go to Athens today, and you can see the, the Areopagus and tour the buildings. It's, it's quite amazing. But Paul was there in the, in the hustle and bustle of the day, in Athens. But his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. Idols are statues that represent a god. And back in the ancient world, all the nations of the world had a patron deity, a patron god, right? What was the patron god of the Canaanites? Anybody know? Baal. Right? What about Moab? I believe it was Chemish. What about the Philistines? Dagon, right? Now, all of these cultures of the world fancied themselves as wise and mature because we follow the gods. And out of their own pride and, and self righteousness, they would send a statue to be displayed in Athens. Athens became a city forested with idols. And, and Paul, who believes in one God, one true God, and all these demonic representations of God that are leading the nations, these demons are a problem. And Paul loves God and the gospel, and he is bothered by all of this paganism around him. Okay? So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. So Paul was doing what Paul does. He's starting to share about Jesus and get people interested and so forth. And also, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, two branches of philosophy that were in Athens, were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Now, that's an interesting uh, phrase there because the words idle babbler were also spoken of Socrates. Socrates was a philosopher in Athens before this time, and he was actually accused of, of preaching strange gods and leading the children astray and ended up having to be put to death for his teaching. So a, a, a city that, that fancies itself in having all these wonderful philosophies, a wonderful philosopher by the name of Socrates comes along and they kill him. Well, they use the same phrase against Paul. Others said, he seems to be proclaimer of strange deities. That's another accusation they gave to Socrates. These people in their self-righteous snobbery were... were we're looking at Paul, who is really a brilliant guy and well-read in all the philosophers, 
and, and they thought that they were being something special by judging him uh, from their standpoint. Oh, we're, we're so wise. You know, every, every nation, every age does this. We look down on the nation, on the, on the earlier centuries and think, oh boy, were they backward. Well, what are they going to think of us in a few more centuries? Oh boy, were they, were they backward. It's silly to judge. One of the things that this group that's been trying to overturn America has been judging is the founding of America, right? We declare these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All men are created equal. And they're trying to like, expunge that from history and come up with a history that says, oh no, back then they were all bad. We got to start over with our good approach, which is enlightened and wise. Foolish, foolish, foolish. That's how people always are. We're foolish. They're foolish. Everyone's foolish, except Jesus. And you're wise to follow him. He seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. That is the unique message. No one else, no other religious leader has ever risen from the dead. And no other God has ever become a man. Christianity is unique. It's the only hope for all these philosophies around the world. Okay, and they took him and brought him To the Areopagus, that's where they did the judging of Socrates, and they're going to judge him, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there, there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So this was a culture of philosophers that were all pseudo-philosophers. They were just wimps and sat around thinking they're so great and they have all, these, all this wisdom to judge others. You know what it reminds me of? Facebook. It reminds me of Facebook. Everybody t- t- uh, posting in their comments and and trying to argue on things. And what happens is all the people who agree with you affirm you and they give you their little hearts and their little smiley faces. And, and the people who speak up, then everybody goes after them because, oh, they need to be judged. That's what's going on in Athens. People sitting around thinking, oh, we're so wise. We want to hear this new philosophy of yours. They're wasting so much time. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. The word religious there actually means superstitious. He's putting them down. All of these idols, it's so superstitious. There's one true God, okay? For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Interestingly, it's true of everyone. We don't have a large enough capacity in our brain to know everything. We are so limited in our knowledge compared to God that it's foolish of us ever to to squawk against him. He knows a lot more than we do. So, So you have to admit as a humanistic philosopher that, that starts with your little tradition of beliefs and, and, and banters things about, you may or may not be right. There's always something we don't know. It may come along, and then we know something new, and then we can change all of our views, and we can go along with the new thing. Awesome. Well, there is someone who knows absolutely everything. If that wasn't true, we wouldn't know about Anything. We wouldn't know how to be saved. Someone, somewhere, knows everything. He's all-knowing. God. And God is a faithful revealer of what we need to know. So rather than start with the philosophies of man, 
Start with this book. If you want to know what the truth is, start with this book. This is the beginning point for a worldview that makes sense in the world that God made and addressed with this book. So it's a, a altar to an unknown God. Just in case we missed one, let's make an altar to someone out there so he doesn't get mad at us. We don't know who he is, but we don't want him to get mad. So Paul is, is, is jibing them and, 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 and kind of making fun of them a little bit here. What you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. The word there for temple is not the Jewish word for temple, like a godly temple, but it's actually the word shrine, like it's a minor thing you're doing. You build these awesome buildings, and they're beautiful. God doesn't live there. What, do you think you can build a house for God? Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything from us, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. All these nations that were sending their, their patron deity in statue form to display in Athens. God made those nations just as he wanted. They rise, they fall, he establishes kings, he tears them down. God does all of this from one bloodline. No nation is full of better people than any other nation. We're all sinners. But God has made the nations for a purpose. That they would seek God. If perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. That idea that he's not far from each one of us is a quote from their philosophers. So Paul obviously knows their writings. But why do we have nations? Why do we have uh, political entities around the world situated the way they are today so that we might seek God. It's an infrastructure for the gospel. Paul brought the gospel to Rome using the Roman roads that were built that led to Rome. Paul used the infrastructure of Rome to reach Rome. We're using the infrastructure of the internet to reach people wherever that our videos go. For the purpose that they would seek God, God made all the nations. He made them from one bloodline. For in him we live and move and exist. Another quote from their philosophers. As even some of your own poets have claimed... For we are also his children. Another quote from the philosophers. Paul sprinkling his message with all the familiar literature that they had produced. So as the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. All these gods that supposedly oversee all these nations are all invented in the minds of man and manipulated by real evil spirits that are, that are at work in the political realms of those nations. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. God's calling the world to repentance because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. All nations, with all of their false gods, they all owe their existence to the one true God whose son came to earth, died on a cross, and rose again. And that message is going to convert the nations. It's going to give an out for the elemental things of this world, all the, all the political structures living in this culture, living in this dark, perverted generation, that's the elemental things to which we were all enslaved. But now Christ has come. His gospel has reached us. We have an option out 
of the wide path that leads to destruction. We can find the narrow gate which leads to the way of life which is narrow. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So they heard the gospel, and there's two kinds of responses. Some are like, oh, our philosophy's better than that. Oh my goodness. Rose from the dead, I'm sure. And some of them are, you know, I don't know if what you're saying is true, but I'm going to consider it. I'm going to keep listening. Two responses that came out of that time with Paul on there. Now, we're all in bondage, right? We're in bondage to the elemental things of the world. We're born into a world that is corrupted and under the thumb of the evil one. And whatever his demonic uh, messengers are, they go over the, the nations and they create worship of them to keep people distracted from the worship of the one true God. Israel didn't have a patron deity. Israel had the one true God. But all the other nations, including America, by the way, have a demonic overlord that's wreaking havoc, keeping the church ostracized, suppressing the truth. This is the elemental things of the world. The world is set up with a political system and it's corrupted by Satan. But you have an out. You can shed the chains when you come to Jesus. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ear so dull that it cannot hear. God loves you, and God wants to reach out to you and speak to your heart. It's not that he can't reach you. His arms are plenty long. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. The problem is, we aren't listening. We're thinking our ways are better. Man's philosophy is, is going to pull man up by his bootstraps and solve our problems. If only we could get those nasty opponents in the political realm out of the way. You know, maybe those opponents in the political realm are all jerks, and we should just call them jerks and not let anybody listen to them, so that our way is the way that comes across. That's just demonic things bouncing around together, uh, against each other. Your iniquities have made the separation and they have caused God's face to be hidden. Romans 3, 10 and 23. There is none righteous, not even one, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're bound in it. We can't get out of it. We're born in it. We're stuck. Except for the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Leave this world behind. Turn from it. It is not your friend. It's going to lead you to destruction. You won't even realize that it's doing it because it's using human philosophy to appeal to your ego to make you think you're right. It's just masking the fact that you're a sinner who needs to be saved. You can't get there yourself. You're never going to be good enough, even though this world might tell you you are. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you our spirit, and our life. John 6, 63. God loves you. 
God knows how you feel every minute of the day. God knows exactly what you need, and he will answer all of your prayers perfectly, even better than you ask him. And he knows you need out of this bondage where you are a citizen of the world and the world is passing away in all of its glory along with it. But you're a citizen of the world from the day you're born. God knows you're bound. He knows you're helpless. He knows you need a way out. That's why he sent his son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That everlasting life is a union, a friendship, a deep abiding faith and wonder and glory in God. The God who made you, who knows you, who knows everything about you and everything about everyone else and everything about this world and who has faithfully revealed to you what you need to know to know him in this book. This book is his word so that we might come to know him, the one true God and Jesus Christ who he sent into this world. God loves you. I know many people are so discouraged and they're so hopelessly grasping at things they think is going to give them meaning or joy in life. They're thinking, if I just get set up with the right job or I just get my, my act together with my friends and, and pick the right friends and if I just come to church and, and get on some kind of a, a, a ministry roster and do something, That'll show God how much he's going to be blessed if he saves me. And God will reward me because I've done all this stuff. We're not saved by any of the works. We're not saved by religion. We're saved by a friendship, a relationship with God that we trust him as the God who has the plan of salvation and we put ourselves in his hands and we listen to him and his spirit fills us and it changes us so that we can act like citizens of his kingdom. And now that we are citizens of his kingdom and his children, we have a mission, a dark world that needs to hear the message that saved us and how it will save them. we got to be about spreading that, that word. That's all that matters. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love. What a wonderful, glorious God you are. You are the God with a plan. You're so wise that, that man's wisdom doesn't compare. Your foolishness is wiser than men. The foolishness of the cross, which seems in man's ego to look so wrong, is actually your wonderful love to pay for our sins so that we can go free and serve and love you forever. What a wisdom that goes back before the foundation of the world, rooted in the God of who's all-loving, all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful. And we can call you Abba Father because of what Jesus has done for us and that you have given us the Holy Spirit. Teach us to have deep affection for you as the one true God, our Creator, and help us to have boldness and stand up strong and tall for the gospel, not being ashamed. It is the power of God for salvation. Lord, we want our hearts to be on fire for you. And we give you our hearts and ask you to make a difference in this world. Bring, bring the light, shine it as a beacon on the testimony of our faith in you, the one true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent to know you is eternal life. We thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.